This episode of Demystified is brought to you by Marmoset. Marmoset, together sounds better. Demystified is a production of Studio Fest. If you're ready to make your debut feature, submit your short film or feature-length screenplay now at filmfreeway.com slash studiofest. This series exists in both video and podcast form, and is designed to be experienced either way. You can find the video version at moviemaker.com, or the audio version wherever you get your podcasts. From Studio Fest and Movie Maker Magazine, this is Demystified, a series about an innovative new way to make movies, and what it really takes to make an indie feature film. My name's Jake Bowen, and this series is about shedding light on the parts of getting an indie film made that are never seen and rarely talked about, through the lens of Studio Fest, a one-of-a-kind annual film festival that awards one writer and one director the chance to make their debut feature film. In this episode, we're going to speak with Slamdance Film Festival legal counsel David Albert Pierce about the contract put forward by a potential distributor, and learn why it's always a good idea to get a lawyer. Last time, we learned that Glasshouse Distribution is interested in distributing the first Studio Fest produced movie, Souvenirs. One of the things that was talked about in that conversation with Glasshouse was the take home percentage they're offering. With a movie like this, we want to keep the fees as low as possible, so it's basically for every dollar you're getting 75 cents, we're getting 25 cents. I like showing actual numbers like that whenever possible because this industry can be so opaque. The show's called Demystified, after all. And we're going to talk real numbers in this episode as well. But numbers can be misleading, too, and they can prompt people to walk away having learned the wrong lesson, so we want to make a few important caveats. First, keep in mind that every distribution deal is different because every film is different. The percentages, the projected sales, the minimum guarantees, all these numbers are based on how profitable the distribution company thinks the individual film is likely to be. And a film's profitability is affected by its genre, cast, production value, subject matter, content, and numerous other factors. Even within one company like Glasshouse, the percentages and minimums can vary quite a bit depending on whether a given film is a specific genre or has notable cast, for example. Now, none of this means the information isn't useful, of course, just that one shouldn't make the mistake of using our experience as a one-size-fits-all template that can be applied to every film or distribution deal. Did you say Glasshouse? Mm -hmm. Yes. Are you working at Laura? No. That's Hannah, one of our producers. Her TikToks are actually hilarious. I mean, I don't even know why you girls bother at this point. Like... I win, (laughs) you lose. (laughs) So for context for you, so we went to AFM, American Mm -hmm. Film Market, and we've been like sort of documenting this process. We met them there um, and they seemed interested in souvenirs. So we had like a dialogue back and forth and then they watched the movie and they came to us with an offer. And then Movie Maker, since they're doing the series, has a contact that's actually the slam dance lawyer. He does a lot of these kinds of negotiations. If none of that sounds familiar, I recommend you check out episodes one through three first to get up to speed. Now, before we talk to David Pierce, we wanted to check in with Matt and Anna, the writer and director of Souvenirs, respectively. Hello. Hello, Hello. Anna. How are you? Hi, everyone. Well, it's good to see you all. Yeah. yeah. I feel like I'm on an episode of Catfish. Of Catfish? You know, at the end, they do that like two months later, and then they catch up with the, the catfishy and the catfisher. And just to be clear, Matt and Anna are the winners of the first Studio Fest, which happened in 2018. Here they are speaking as finalists at the 2018 festival. Uh, I'm Matthew Cirillo. Uh, I'm originally from Queens, New York, but uh, I've uh, resided in Las Vegas, Nevada for about 22 years now. Matt has a masterful grasp of story structure and pacing, and an incredible work ethic that I've seen firsthand. If you need a story broken, He's your guy. I've been writing scripts for about as long as I can remember. You know, my dad was a high school art teacher, but he taught an elective of film. And as a kid, all I knew was my dad was studying these things and that meant that they must be really important. And so kind of since I was a really little kid, uh, being a screenwriter is all I've really wanted to do. I've kind of devoted my whole life towards that end, even the job I work in the day. I'm a bartender at a pool in Las Vegas because I only have to work for about nine months out of the year. And then for about three months of the year over the winter, I get to sit at my kitchen table and hammer away at my uh, keyboard. I would love to write a script in just about any genre. I've done a heist film. I've done several uh, original television pilots, a time travel movie. I would submit that it's probably the only time travel movie uh, where the plot actually makes sense. I love having a a kernel of an idea and following it to its logical conclusion. Who doesn't love a good story? And to be the guy that gets to provide that, well, I mean, that's that's a fantastic experience. I'm Anna. Uh, I'm from Hong Kong and I was born there and then I was raised in Tokyo. Uh, My dad's Japanese and my mother's Chinese and then I moved back to Hong Kong for a little bit and then I came here for college and I went to NYU. 
Um, I went to Tisch for acting and journalism, and I kind of found my way to filmmaking in the recent years. Being an actress herself, Anna Mikami is very much an actor's director. She has a particular focus on and gift for pulling great performances out of her actors. Here she is in her award-winning short film, Do. I'm attracted to stories with strong characters. They don't have to necessarily be likable, but I feel like a good character reflects some part of humanity that is relatable and that can reveal things about people that they may not really see much of. That's why I'm attracted to filmmaking. Like, if you can tell just a story, if you can follow a character, if just if you're able to get that technical skill, you can translate it to all different kinds of mediums and genres, and I think it'll still work. How are things? How is the movie? What's going on? Tell me. I'm curious. Things are busy. Things are really busy, but good. We're still figuring out things, but we've gotten to an exciting place with souvenirs, and we wanted to just talk through it with you all. Justin Charles filled Matt and Anna in on the potential distribution deal. And then you two, as gross profit holders, will see 10 cents for every dollar that comes from them first. So that's basically the landscape right now. Um, how would, for example, if we get into like a good like mid-tier film festival, how would that affect negotiating? You know, like if we got, for example, if we got into Atlanta, would that change the game a little bit? That's the risk. Do you do well in festivals and cultivate some sort of mythology around it so that people are interested in buying and you maybe get a bidding war going? Or do you sign with a distributor and when you do get into festivals, then they function as a, a publicity bump? They want festivals. us to go to as many festivals as possible as distributors. They're encouraging us to submit. Okay, that sounds good. Excited. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're excited. <laughs> I think getting a distributor out of the gates uh, and this quickly just is very promising for everything in general. And yeah, I guess we want to check in and make sure we've got both of your blessing if the contract looks good, if we should pursue with Glass House or not. Right before you sign, do you mind talking with me? Yeah. I'm having lunch with my manager tomorrow and I'll just talk it through with him, but it should be good. Sure, great. Just want to make sure that we're all covered. Well, fortunately, I only have to discuss it with my dog, and so <laughs> <laughs> whatever you guys think is best, I defer to your uh, judgment. And okay, we're cool. deferring to a, a lawyer at Slam Dance's judgment, so. Yeah, because we don't know anything yeah. either. I mean, we're doing this for the first time, too, so. I don't know anything so. either. So we're so, like, let, uh, like, let's talk to the guy that's the most qualified in this thing. So yeah, we'll let you know what he says. Yeah. Great, thank you, great job. Thanks yeah. for, you know, Sorry. thank you for doing all this work and the post process. Yeah. I'm just chilling. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for uh, joining us on this journey. Hopefully our film has a nice long life ahead of it. Yeah. And uh, we'll get to see a little feature in Fangoria maybe at some point, or uh, yeah, never know. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, Thanks, guys. everyone. All right. Bye. Good talking to you guys. After the break, we talked to lawyer David Pierce. This episode of Demystified is brought to you by Marmoset. Marmoset is not a stock music site. It's a curated collection of real music by real musicians, bands, and record labels, often with entire albums available from a single musician or band. They have an award-winning music production team who collaborates with artists and bands to record original music, sound design, and custom scores. I used Marmoset while editing souvenirs, and one of the coolest features I found is the ability to sort tracks by their arc, a visual representation of the progression of the music. It's extremely useful and saves you a ton of time. Visit marmosetmusic.com to browse music now. Marmoset. Together sounds better. David Pierce looked over Glasshouse's contract and proposed some changes. Here are his notes and general advice that I think are most interesting and useful. Number one, authorize and identify sub-distributors. You always want to know who's handling your picture. You know, a lot of times you go to the American film market and you'll see the same film handled by six different people and they all have like little sub-distribution deals with the main distributor. You should have some control over that. Are there opportunities in distributors to have sort of like shell scenarios where they have another distributor? Completely. Yeah. Completely. You want to find out that the rights in Italy went to a bona fide distributor in Italy. Number two, title changes. The understanding that any change in title will be conveyed in writing to producers so sales and licensing may be properly tracked. Uh, different territories change the title all the time. The last thing you want is to not know what title 
vital it is under France and not even be able to find it, you know. So at least you can make them tell you the new title. But then, you know, if we're ever accounting and we find out somewhere along the line that the name switched, we can hold them responsible if they didn't tell you what the, the name was in every territory. Number three, forewalling. The event distributor does not have active plans for theatrical distribution. Producers shall have the non-exclusive right to forewall the picture via direct contractual dealing with specific theaters without obligation to distributors. And just for clarity, uh, what would you say the definition of forewall is? Just making a deal directly with the theater to rent out the theater, that type of thing. Gotcha. So I'm just saying, hey, you know, if after the first year you don't have active theatrical plans, let us do it on our own on a four-wall basis. Where, where, where are you from, Charles? I'm from Michigan. And where'd you go to school? It's called Grand Valley. So you go to Grand yeah. Valley, you know, you, if they have a film program, local alum does good. You, you show the movie and you have a little Q&A afterwards. You go in and you do a four-wall and with a little lecture series. Yep. And that, that's a nice night out between the producers, directors, writer. There could be you know, half a dozen colleges and, and, and towns that are affiliated with the different people that can claim this is my movie. That, mm-hmm. That's always a, a nice way to make money. Four, caps on the duration of licensing agreements. You need to put a cap on how far out they can license a territory. And if they wait until year seven to license Germany and they license Germany for 21 years, Right. Your film's not coming back for 28 years. Right. For 25000 they could, you know, jam you up for the next 30, 40 years. Five, meaningful consultation. We want meaningful consultation, not just good faith consultation with marketing. What would you say the difference is? Good faith is, yeah, tell us what you think. Okay, fine, goodbye. Meaningful consultation is still not mutual approval, but they have to listen to you and give you a little bit more time a day than just saying, well, okay, we consulted with you, goodbye. It just gives you a little more teeth to let you be involved in the marketing. He also recommends you manage your expectations. Whatever numbers are promised in that computer, those those minimums, you need to fully be okay with and anticipate, you know, until the contract comes back, that that is likely to be the only money you see from this film. And then the one other thing that's super important is... The SAG Distributors Assumption Agreement. SAG, by the way, is the Screen Actors Guild, the union that represents actors and other performing artists. When you made your SAG film, one of the things that you wanted to SAG was a clause that said, we promise that we will have any distributor fully sign the distributor's assumption agreement so that you are off the hook and the distributor is on the hook for SAG residuals. And all of the uh, sales agents say the same thing. They don't even know what this is. You know, we're just the agents. We're not the distributors, blah, 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 blah. And they refuse to sign the distributor's assumption agreement. SAG is going to find out how much the gross revenues worldwide were on the film. And and the royalties and residuals that are owed to the actors are based on that gross number, not the number that you received. And SAG's going to say, you didn't sign it, you didn't get a distributor's assumption agreement, so you, the producer's on the hook. And what's crazy is, in 2001, all of the unions lobbied Congress to have a provision in the Copyright Act that says, if a distributor, and the definition of distributor includes a sales agent, if they knew or reasonably should have known that SAG actors were involved, then they are deemed by operation of law, who have signed the distributor's assumption agreement. And when we get this letter in two or three years from SAG saying, you know, you owe residuals and these are what we think these residuals are, we can say, pursuant to the Federal Copyright Act, the distributors are deemed to have assumed this responsibility, go after them, not us. And it was the unions themselves that got that provision in the law. However, it has been my experience that... The unions prefer to do things the easy way, and they would much rather go into arbitration against you, who don't have experience, who don't have the money to pay top-notch lawyers. And so they just ignore this fact. They say, well, you're the one that we have a contract with. Maybe we have that ability, but we're not exercising that ability. And, you know, what are you going to do? And it's very frustrating that they do that, but more often than not, that is what happens. 
And finally, watch out for hidden expenses. It seems that the primary way unscrupulous sales agents take advantage of filmmakers is by charging them for inflated or unnecessary expenses for marketing materials, travel, things like that. A lot of these uh, distributors, they, you know, they make a lot of money just doing that. You know, they'll, they'll have 15 films and they go to Cannes. They charge all 15 filmmakers the cost of the uh, airfare to Cannes and the hotel. Like, no, that all has to be prorated. I'm always trying to talk to distributors and, and people that are starting out companies and saying, you know, who can just be the one honest sales agent? <laughs> you, you will do so well mm -hmm. and you will have such a path with, with such great films. Mm -hmm. Well, why not, why not try that approach? Mm -hmm. And there's some distributors, when their name is mentioned, I say, guys, these guys are going to f*** you. It's 100%. <laughs> But Glasshouse, I like what they're saying. I like that, you know, they're saying we're a new prototype and we're, you know, we're coming up with, you know, our terms are a little bit different than just the average yeah. run-of-the-mill run terms. Uh, they're not sending out warning signs that says this is a crook, don't be in business with them. Mm -hmm. They are playing within the rules of the distributors. They're in some areas, they're giving you a little bit more. They talk a good game. They, they, they talk about being excited. So, sounds like all in all, a pretty fair deal. David proposed a number of other changes to the contract, but there was one that seemed particularly oh, audacious. Well, um, Jess and Charles called me up a few days later to fill me in. You want to talk about the contract? Yeah. So, we've been back and forth on the contract for souvenirs. Their offer originally was 25000 year one, and then every subsequent year, if they made us at least minimum $10,000, they would renew for the next year and the next year. And so, the lawyer we brought on said to go from $10,000 to $140,000, which I thought, that's insane, and these guys are probably never gonna talk to us again, but like, whatever, <laughs> so we send it through. And so they <laughs> they just countered with 85,000 for like, year two and year three. So yeah. 25,000 year one, 85,000 year two and three. Well, sure. that's what they need to make us in order to retain the rights to it. Okay. Right. Yeah, so that's it's good. Really so cool. if they don't make us 25, we get the movie back. And if they don't make us 85, we get the movie back. <laughs> they said they're very filmmaker friendly, and I kind of agree. Yeah. You know, right. That, right, and optimistically yeah. speaking, you know, because I only speak optimistically, <laughs> we have uh, them countering with eight, at 85 tells us they think that's something they can actually achieve as well. I mean, I'm hopeful that them giving us those numbers mean we'll actually see those numbers, but like there's still a little bit of wait and see, I guess. Right. Also, if you break down the numbers, I think for them to be sustainable and for it to be worth their time, they do have to hit a minimum dollar amount that they're making us if they're only make 25% of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we make 75 on it. I'm just shocked. I mean, when somebody starts at 10 and the next person goes to 140, like clearly like get a lawyer. I would just say to anyone doing this, like definitely get yourself a lawyer. Because Stay tuned after the break for a preview of future episodes. Thanks to our sponsor, Marmoset. Marmoset is a full service music agency representing a highly curated roster of diverse and rare artists, bands, record labels, and vintage recordings for music licensing. Visit marmosetmusic.com to browse music now. Marmoset, together sounds better. Demystified is a production of Studio Fest. If you're ready to make your debut feature, submit your short film or feature length screenplay now at filmfreeway.com slash studiofest. Coming up in future episodes, we look at the challenges of collaboration on a feature between people who've never worked together before. And how do we continue to produce during a pandemic? I thought there was a pandemic long before it was called a pandemic. Demystified is a Studio Fest production presented by Movie Maker. This episode was narrated and edited by me, Jake Bowen. It was conceived and recorded by Jess Jacklin, Charles Beal, and Jake Bowen. The theme song was composed by Patrick Patrikios. Additional tracks and music supervision were provided by Marmoset. You can find links in the show notes to some of the tracks used in this episode. To hear future episodes, episodes of Demystified, go to moviemaker.com or visit studiofest.com, where you can also learn more about Studio Fest and subscribe to the show.